I'm beginning a series now for the summer on the disciples of Jesus Christ. And there's no better disciple to begin with than Peter. And so I'll begin there. Would you bow your heads as we seek him in prayer? Dear Father, I thank you so much for the privilege of the word that brings us my, our minds back to the past, that we might recognize thy providence for the present. I pray that you'll make the word practical, that you'll give us insights into the character of Peter, and thereby give us insights into our own character. And may we be able to leave today knowing that as thou hast loved Peter, you love us. In the name of our blessed Lord. Amen. Some time ago, I had the privilege of visiting a very close friend of mine, in fact, friends, plural, brother and sister Ray Turner. Now, you Adventists out there, old-time Adventists, will know right away who I'm talking about. They used to be the singing evangelist for the Dedimore team. And I was in Edinburgh, Texas. Now, that's an interesting place for a boy from Brooklyn to be. But I was in Edinburgh, Texas, South Texas, visiting this family on a little farm. We talked for some time that night because we had a lot of catching up to do. But finally, past 12, I said, hey, i got to get to bed. I had three preaching appointments that day, a flight to San Antonio, a graduation, and then a flight down to South Texas. I was bushed. So I went to bed, ready to sleep. And that's one thing good about me. I can get to bed and get to sleep. I mean, I touch the pillar and I'm out. Now, I wake up early but I get to bed good. I mean, I can enjoy it, getting to bed. I don't know how long I've been sleeping, but all of a sudden I was awakened by the crowing of a barnyard rooster in the middle of the night. I mean, it was disturbing. It's one of the most disturbing sounds, shattering sounds, eerie sounds I've ever heard. Every two or three minutes, this dumb rooster in the middle of the night. Now, I don't know how many times that night he let me know he was there. But I wanted to let him know I was there. I wish I was back in Brooklyn to those normal sounds, like an ambulance screeching through the street. A hundred honking horns. I mean, nice sounds to sleep by. The elevator train that rattled by my tenement. Those kind of sounds. But the crowing of a barnyard rooster, it shattered my nerves and put my nerves on end. I guess sounds like that do different things to different people. If you heard the crowing of a cock, a barnyard rooster right now, some of you would remember your childhood. I mean, right away, visions would come to your mind. Homemade bread. Smell it, can't you? Starched curtains. The sound of the tractor. The look of a mother's face. The touch of velvet. The velvet of a sunset. Memories. Wholesome memories of childhood. But as I lay there, I could not get to sleep because it disturbed my conscience. And I was brought back in mind 1900 years ago to a time when someone else was disturbed by the crowing of a cock. The sound of a barnyard rooster. And it shattered and fragmented his night and his heart and his life. Now it's imperative for Christians to look back because that gives us better vision to look forward. Look back to a man by the name of Simon Peter. Now the only reason we remember Simon Peter is because he came in contact with Jesus Christ and because of that contact 
He lives today. Now, I guess there were happy days for Simon. Being a fisherman, I can empathize with Simon Peter. He was a fisherman. In fact, he was a macho man. He would have made a good bud commercial. Grab all the gusto, man, you know, the big arms. Hmm. Peter, the gospel's full of him. You can't read very far without coming face to face with Simon Peter. You hear him everywhere. Sometimes you wish you didn't hear him. You can identify with him, though, because you are like Simon in a lot of ways. At least I am. He never lives on level ground. Have you noticed that? Even about your own life? Up on a mountain one day, down in the valley the other? He's capable of such moral extremes, stability and instability. Courage. Cowardice. Strength. And weakness. Love. And hate. As Simon the man of sand, he sinks into the depths of despair and misery. As Simon the rock, he rises to heights of spiritual and intellectual and moral grandeur. Now, there are four scenes and four characteristics about this man that we see in the events of his life that I need to share with you. First of all, there's the calling of Simon. Secondly, there's the cowardice of Simon. Thirdly, there is the conversion of Simon. And fourthly, there is the crucifixion of Simon. And there is within the life of every man, woman, and child ever born a calling. And there is a time of cowardice. And a time of conversion. And yes, a time of cruci crucifixion. Now his calling came in a very unique way. He was mending nets on the Sea of Galilee, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. A big man, a tough man, a fisherman... And the shadow of Christ falls upon him. The Gospels describe it. The events are clear. It's history. It's as much a history as the story of Abraham Lincoln. The story of President Roosevelt. The story of Simon Peter. He's mending his nets on the Sea of Galilee, the shore, and the shadow of Christ falls upon him. And he looks up into the face of Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, I want you to follow me. No man can look at Jesus. And remain uncommitted. He says, Peter, I want you to leave these nets and I want you to follow me. Now, that was a calling to destiny. It was a calling to discipleship. It was a calling even to his death. Little did Simon know what God was going to expect of him or I don't believe he would have left his nets. If I knew what God wanted me to go through to be called, I would never responded to the call. And I would have to say that openly and admittedly. You see, now in that calling I discovered an invitation because Mark's Gospel, and in the Greek it says that in Mark it means to invite, to invite someone to do something. Peter, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. He invites Peter to leave his nets and to become a net caster for souls. In Luke, it means to summons. And so here Jesus Christ summons Peter. He invites Peter. Isn't it interesting how Jesus sees people differently than you or I see them? I mean, if I was going to start a revolution, and I was going to get a religion started, I would not begin with fishermen. You see, we have a tendency to think that the people that can do things in life are only the people who have been greatly gifted in life. God always begins with the small and He builds it to the big. He begins with the infinitesimal and He makes them something and someone. And He takes Simon and He says, I'll make you a fisher of men, Simon. And Simon says, well, I'll follow. What do I have to lose? But 
But when Jesus sought the man Simon, he did not seek to give him glory and to seek him to fame and to fortune and to rulership. It was a call to privation and persecution and pain and ridicule. And whenever God calls a man or a woman, it is not to a gilded road. And too many Christians who come to know Christ know him for the wrong reasons. It isn't easy being a Christian. And it doesn't make life easier. It makes the, ple the future more pleasant. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Christian, discovered that. And listen to what he said as he was in the concentration camp in Germany, and what he said about the cost of discipleship. He said this, Faith can no longer mean sitting still and waiting. They must rise and follow Him. The call frees them from all earthly ties and binds them to Jesus Christ alone. They must burn their boats and plunge into absolute insecurity in order to learn the demand and the gift of Christ. Follow me, Peter, to Samaria where they will reject you because of their prejudices. Follow me, Peter, to the well at the curb of Sychar. Follow me, Peter, to the mobs of our own family who will reject you because you have become a part of the family of God. Follow me, Peter. Follow me, please, to the tomb of Lazarus. Follow me to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Follow me to the hill of Golgotha. To the Mount of Transfiguration. And to the Mount of Crucifixion. Follow me, Peter, to Jerusalem. Follow me, Peter, to Rome. It was a calling, an invitation. But secondly, as a calling, it was a selection. Of all the Peters that ever lived, God chose that Peter to become the preacher of Pentecost. Can you imagine of all the Peters that, just as of all the Marys that Christ ever chose, He chose that Mary to cradle Him and to give Him birth and to give life meaning. Simon, thou hast been selected in time and eternity in the providence and the sovereign will of God. I have chosen you to become Peter. You did not choose me, He said but I have chosen you. How marvelous it is to know that Jesus Christ as Lord has called each of us to a special duty, each of us to a special work, and there is a sense of fruitfulness and a sem sense of emptiness and a sense of listlessness for a man or woman not to feel that call. There is no direction in life until the life is directed by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an invitation. Come, Peter. It was a selection. Have you ever wondered why God has chosen you to come here this day and to worship? You say, well, God isn't that really that concerned about me as an individual. If He wasn't concerned about you as an individual, why was He concerned to talk to a fisherman and to call him by his right name and to give him his right occupation and then to help him along through life? God does not bring about creation in you in His image to let that image be wandered, tossed to and fro by providence or, or, excuse me, by chance. You are in the will of God, the providence of God. And when you've been called of God, you have been selected of all the Peters, Marys, Johns, Jones. But thirdly, it was an appointment, that calling. You see, the moment Peter was God's man for God's plan and God's purpose and God's place, he was an appointed an apostle of Jesus Christ. God did not educate him and then say, you are an apostle. He made him an apostle to educate him. When I was 16 years old and found Christ as a gang leader in New York, I was illiterate. I could not read or write. But God called me first before he educated me. And he has a lot more education for me yet. You see, Peter left his net straightway, the Bible says. It was quick. It was a moment. Conversion does not take invitation or call. does not take a lot of time. It takes but one moment for a man to decide. 
a violin placed in a little child's hand. And that little child says, I will be a violinist. <laughs> That's the beginning of education. The dream is always but a moment. The reality is a lifetime. And when he said, Simon Peter, I'm going to make you a fisher of men, come and follow me. Immediately he left his nets to follow Jesus. Immediately he left at that moment to be educated, and it took him a lifetime to be educated. And that was the calling of Peter. But I cannot read the word of God. I cannot come to the life of that one called Simon without coming to the reality that he was a coward at times. There are two examples in the Bible, shows his cowardice. And in every person, I don't care how brave you are, how tough you are, how macho you are, there are times when you are afraid. Huh? There were times when Vice President of the Beachcombers was afraid. There are times now, as your pastor, I am deathly afraid. There are times that I am a man deathly afraid. Now, most men don't want to admit that. It changes their idea of manhood. But Simon Peter, who was a fisherman, a, bra a brawling fisherman, is out one day on the sea. And the sea doesn't frighten this man, Peter. The sea doesn't frighten him. He'd been out on the sea many times. A storm comes up. The wind whips over the, the desert and out across the Sea of Galilee. And those who've ever gone to the Sea of Galilee know that that can happen. And the calm sea can be turned into a fomenting, wavy, stormy lake or sea. All of a sudden, the water's coming over the boat, and Simon is the only one relaxed. He's a fisherman. The other disciples are frightened. And then all of a sudden, Simon sees Jesus in the storm. And I tell you, when Jesus Christ comes in the storm, that is when men and women are made for God. It is easy to worship a God on a crucifix or in a beautiful stained glass window in a church where you just sit in a pew and listen. But it's very difficult to serve God in a storm. But it's those people who see Jesus clearly. A sail ship sails better in the storm. And the storm is riling up the sea and the water is coming over. And Peter looks through the storm and he sees Jesus walking on the water. And Jesus says, Simon, come. He calls him again. And now Simon jumps out of the boat. Now, I would have taken my shoes off and tested the water. Come on now, you would have done the same thing. I would have tested the water. But not this man Simon. He jumps out of the boat. And all the apostles are looking and he's on top of the water. Now, that was a miracle in those days. Nowadays, the East River, it's no miracle to walk on the water. Polluted as that water is, it's no miracle. But in those days, it was a miracle to walk on that clean, clear water. And Simon Peter's walking on the water, and now he gets, you know, he wants to show everybody else how macho he is. And he turns around wondering where the other apostles are. And they're still in the boat. And when he takes his eyes off Jesus, what happens? He begins to sink. Now comes the fear in the heart of Peter. And he says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches out and saves him. He shows fear. But the second example to show the cowardice of this man called Peter was in the courtyard. Now, I've got to give credit to Peter that he was one of the only disciples that stayed by Jesus after he had been arrested and was on trial. But he's kind of mixed in with the crowd. Can you picture it? Do you love me, Peter? I love you, Lord. Peter, don't you love me? My Lord, I love you. I'll go anywhere with you. Lovest me, Peter? And a woman saw him in the crowd, and she said, There's one of them. Not me. Hey, not me. You say, what a terrible disciple. But come on now, haven't you done that in your own experience as so-called Christians? Come on now, haven't you? Not me. <laughs> Peculiar Christian? What are you? No, no, no. You think of someone else. Oh, another woman comes along. She says, Ha! Ah, there he is! That's one of them! That's one of the disciples! Hey, I swear on it! I mean, on the Israeli flag. Huh? The Jewish flag. I mean, I swear on it! 
I don't know the man. And you know the frightful thing, brothers and sisters, he had walked with him three and a half years and he didn't know the man. You can walk with Jesus 20 years and not know the man. And think you know him. And think you know all about him. And the third woman saw him and said, he's one of the disciples. And they listened and it gave, his language gave it away, his speech. That would be like me going to, when I was in India, they knew right away I wasn't an Indian. My speech betrayeth me. I was preaching in Dallas, Texas, and they said, your speech betrayeth you. I visited my church a few weeks ago, and they were from New York, and they says, your speech betrayeth you. The language of a fisherman betrayeth him. The curses of a fisherman betrayeth. But yet the words of the Galilean betrayed him. Do you love me, Peter? Why, Lord, you know I love you. And at that moment, listen to me, at that moment was the conversion of Simon Peter. He looked up as he said, I don't know the man and curses and swearing in the filthy language of a fisherman. And he looked up and he saw the face of Jesus. And Jesus looked at him. Lovest me, Peter? And he wept bitterly. Weeping, weeping bitterly in the Bible means he had total repentance. Have you ever felt that way about God? The end of the day you felt you really blew it. And you denied him. And you betrayed him. And you wept bitterly. You see, the great thing about the kingdom of God is that not God is not interested in finding a way to catch us sinning. He is trying to find a way. He's trying to find a way that He can forgive us for our sinning. And He found the way. He looked at Peter. And said in his heart, you do love me, Peter. And Peter did love him. That's the experience of the conversion of this man called Simon, called Peter. You see, we are much like Peter, aren't we? What cheap things do we betray and deny our Lord for? What, what, what kind of things do we deny him what ambitions and what selfishness and what, for what reasons do you deny him? And what have you denied him this week? I've always said to you, we do not all sin alike, but alike we all sin. It's not the kind of sin that separates us from God. It's sin. And it's not a separate kind of forgiveness. It's the only kind of forgiveness. I love you, Peter. The conversion with heart pounding, tears streaming down his face, he fell at the cross. He repents. And now it comes time for crucifixion. Simon was called. Simon was a coward. Simon, Simon was converted or convicted. But now we see Simon in the final stage of crucifixion. Now we don't have the record in the Bible, so I had to go to history to find it. Eusebius. A church father, it was a pretty good, reliable person, wrote about it. He wrote about it in Acts of Peter 35. And you see, Peter already went from Jerusalem, he went to Pentecost, he went to Antioch, he was traveling around the world preaching the message of Christ, and now he finds himself in Rome, that great city of Rome. And it's in the midst of persecution, and there are two persecutors there in Rome about A.D. 61. There was Agrippa and Albinus, and they wanted to kill Peter. You could see how he would be disturbing. Eh? You'd be revolutionary for Christ, and they'll all want to kill you. And so they want to kill him, and the church is a reasonable church, and you see they're always running on logic. And they sit down with Peter one night, and they say, hey, Peter, you are too young to die. And he had to agree on that. I would have. 
Hey, I mean, you see, Maud is come almost by accident. And so Peter says, uh, yes, I am kind of young to die. He says, well, Peter, why don't you flee the city of Rome? Pack up your suitcases, go. You'll live a little longer. You'll be able to preach a little longer. Uh, you'll be able to encourage the churches a little longer. God doesn't want to have your life cut short now. And so Peter packs his suitcase, his manuscripts, his Bible, and he steals off in the night. As he exits the city of Rome, he sees someone coming towards Rome. And he recognizes it's Jesus. And Peter is overwhelmed and excited. He says, Lord, where are you going? He says, to Rome, Peter. To Rome? To be crucified. But Lord, you've already been crucified. But I must go to Rome. And be crucified. And Peter understands. He goes, so goes the tradition that Jesus was going into Rome to bear the cross that Peter was running away from. And Peter says, no Lord, I will go. See him now, Peter. Entering the city of Rome. See him now. Lovest thou me, Peter? Lord, you know I love you. I go to Rome, Peter. No, Lord. I will go to Rome. And they captured Peter, and they put him in chains. And the lictor came and beat his back and lacerated his back until it was bloody raw meat. And he sung a hymn. Lovest me, Peter? And they stripped him of his clothes, and they stood him before the multitudes naked that they might mock him. Lovest me, thou, Peter? You know I love you. And they placed a cross on his back. And he carried the cross to the place of execution in Rome. And there were the early church believers and they were surrounded there that hill as they looked at this man Peter. Simon called Peter. And they pound nails, spikes into his hands, his wrists and into his feet. And they're about ready to lift the cross. He says, one last request. And even Roman soldiers are merciful to a last request. Turn me upside down. See him now. Simon called Peter. They lift the cross and they turn it upside down. And they drop it with a thud into the earth. Turn me upside down that I might be right side up was the cry of Peter. The sun's setting now over Rome but my brothers and sisters the sun will never set upon that scene because that love that shines through the cross of Golgotha and the cross of Rome still shines through to us today. Simon bleeding, dying, singing. You see, that day will never be forgotten as long as there are men and women who believe and have faith in this Christ. As long as there are hymns to be sung. And as long as there's disciples to preach, he will never die. Turn us upside down, that we may be right side up. Upside down world, right side up world. Father which art in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we thank you for that story. Because it tells us that perhaps we're looking from the wrong perspective at life. Perhaps the things we think right 
are not as right as we think. And perhaps we need to be crucified upside down so that we might see right side up. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. If I were to close this meeting and not open to you the invitation that Jesus Christ himself would make, I would be remiss of the gospel of God. And we're going to have our closing hymn, and as we do in our church, I'm going to invite those that would like to respond to the gospel or to the message this morning and would like to repent or would like to come in reconsecration to Jesus Christ to come here for the benediction and for prayer. I'm going to come down first because I need to respond first. May God bless you. If there's a man or a woman, a child, a teenager that would like to respond to Jesus Christ today, I invite you to come and meet me here and I will meet with you and God will meet with both of us. God bless you now as we sing and as I invite you to come, won't you please respond?